once again. And, and in the aftermath to the debacle that was the 2012 election, you undoubtedly have seen on all the cable news channels and all the newspapers and, and practically everywhere, every pundit you can think of, every advisor you can think of, every political strategist you can think of, sitting there on the television telling you that the GOP, the Republican Party, must move more to the center in order to win elections in the future. Why they've got this woeful tale they'll tell you that if the Republican Party doesn't move to the center, oh, we'll just be irrelevant forevermore and shoot, we'll probably never win a presidential election again. Now, ignoring that this is the kind of thing that comes out every time the Republican Party loses a presidential election, ignoring that for a second, let's think about something. Would that strategy of the Republican Party moving to the center, would that be the right strategy for America? Not necessarily for winning elections, but th would that be the right strategy for our future as a nation? Well, let's consider that question. But before we consider it, let's take a step back and let's think about what political parties exist for, why we have political parties, what do political parties do? Take a second and think about it. Political parties, whether we're talking about the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, this applies to both of them, political parties exist for two reasons and only two reasons. Number one, they exist to raise money. Number two, they exist to win elections. That's it. That's all. That's the only reason you have political parties. Okay? Political parties do not exist to better America, nor do they exist to push ideologies or ideas that will stand us in good stead for our future, except to the extent that doing those things will help them raise money or win elections. Now, I'm not saying that as a negative thing. That's the, that's the part in the process that political parties play. That's what they do. That's their cog in the machine. Okay? Likewise, these advisors you see on, on the cable news and these political strategists, they're cut from the same cloth because, remember, they're only on TV. They're only on the cable news channels while they're waiting for their next political candidate somewhere to hire them and help them win an election. So they're trying to just kind of stay, stay there with some face time, if you will, until they get hired again. So they're thinking along the same lines. Their idea is how do I win an election, not how do I improve America. Their careers, their paychecks, their livelihood, the food on their table... Their kids' college tuition depends on winning elections, nothing more, nothing less. Their livelihood does not depend on putting America in a better position for its future. Now, you and I, the voters, our livelihood does depend on that, or at least, you know, retaining the livelihood we put together, right? So, in other words, those you are hearing on cable news and on, on uh, the newspapers, and of course, all these, a lot of these people are Republicans, don't get me wrong. All these people you're hearing who are making this, I, this notion and this idea that the GOP needs to further moderate itself and go further to the center, they are only doing so with the short-term goal of winning elections in mind. The more important long-term goals of solving our fiscal problems, of solving our crisis of, of national character that has gone by the wayside, those ideas are not entering into their thinking whatsoever. And their mindset is not and, and really cannot be to do what is right for America. Instead, their mindset must be focused only on the short-term goal of winning elections. Okay, again, not a criticism. That's their cog in the machine. That's their role to play. I get it. But I think when we hear these strategies, when we hear these ideas, we need to take it into that bit of context. We need to take it with that grain of salt to understand that it's coming strictly from the perspective of how can the Republicans win an election and nothing more. Now, you and I, are probably a lot less concerned about that. You and I care about America's future. You and I don't really care so much if we get some guy in the White House who arbitrarily has an R after his name. We want someone in the White House who's going to move America in the right direction. It's a totally different mindset. It's a totally different set of goals. It's a totally different set of, of, of ideas of where we can get to in our future. But nevertheless, understanding that there's a conflict between those two visions... Does that theory that these advisors are giving you, that the Republican Party needs to go further to the center, does that theory even make sense, even within their own realm of winning elections, even within their own idea of we have to do this to win an election, does it even make sense there? Well, the more I think about it, the less I think it does make sense. I mean, think about it. For two elections in a row now, 2008, 2012, the Republican Party has run two disgustingly moderate candidates against 
Barack Obama, who is the, the biggest left-wing ideologue that I've seen in my lifetime. You'd have to go back to an LBJ or an FDR to find someone worse and more un-American than Barack Obama is. And even so, neither of these centrists have done well. You can go and look at practically any piece of analysis you want to, and it will tell you that Mitt Romney did a poor job of generating enthusiasm and getting his base out to vote. He failed in that regard. Barack Obama got his base out. Likewise with John McCain, same thing happened with him. Although in that case it was minimized a little bit because at least he had Sarah Palin on the ballot. And this is where I think these pundits and advisors and people within the leadership of the Republican Party are playing it too close to the vest. They're playing an ultra-defensive strategy. They're playing that, if you're a football fan, you might remember that old prevent defense that people used to play back in the 1980s. You know, where you, you just put everybody in the goal line and you'd let the other team dink and dunk down the field and... You uh, you'd stop him in the end zone, and what would always happen? You'd lose the game. You'd go into a fourth quarter of the league, you'd start playing the prevent defense, and you'd lose. That's why nobody plays the prevent defense anymore. But in a political sense, that's exactly what these guys are, are saying we should do in the Republican Party. That we should just not attack the liberals, not attack the Democrats, not be aggressive with them, but just hang back, just hang back, let them move wherever they want to move, and then try and get them on election day. Try and get them in the fourth quarter. The problem is that much like in football, much like in life, politics works the same way. If you play not to lose, if you play without aggression in any aspect of life, you'll very rarely win. And when you do win in those rare cases, you'll just squeak one out. You won't be dominant. You won't be able to set up something for the future. Instead, I think it's time at long last for the Republican Party to clearly differentiate itself from the Liberals and from the Democratic Party. Provide a clear alternative at last to what the Democratic Party is selling, not just a watered-down version of liberalism. Not only for the chance to win elections, but I think it would help America in the future. Now, a lot of you are probably hearing this and asking, how is that going to be palatable to the American public? If the, if the Republican Party goes further to the right and stands more with conservatism, isn't that going to alienate everyone? I'm not so sure that it will. Think about something. Americans are looking for an alternative to what they see in Washington today. And it's not just conservatives. When was the last time you heard anybody, not just someone on TV or not just a politician, but the people you work with, the people you see at the bank, the people you see at the grocery store, the people you see down at the bar, when's the last time you heard any of them say that they are satisfied with what Washington does or that they like business than usual in Washington or that they have faith in our government as it stands? You rarely hear anybody say that, whatever their political stripe is, whatever their background is, whatever their race is, whatever their gender is. That might be the one thing we all can agree on, is that we hate Washington. We hate it for different reasons, but we all hate it. And so we're at a point in history, unlike the last 50 years, we're at a point in history, finally, where people are willing to consider and listen and even embrace alternatives to what we've seen in Washington for so many years. And if you want some proof, you can see a lot of different places. Look at the Tea Party that sprang up. That was a, essentially a middle finger to Washington politics. Look at the Ron Paul supporters. And I'm no Ron Paul fan. You guys know that. There's some things I agree with them on, some things I vehemently disagree with them on. But you got to say, he inspired a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of people saying, hey, that guy sounds different. I'm interested in hearing what he has to say. And on the other side of the aisle, as much as I despise it, look at the Occupy Wall Street movement. That, that was lefties and leftists saying, you know what, we really don't like what's going on in Washington. Maybe there's a better way. All of these different things show you that the American people as a whole, the electorate as a whole, is dissatisfied with what they're seeing out of Washington. And they're looking for some kind of alternative. They're willing to listen to other things. They're willing to listen to things different than what our parents and grandparents said. And that's where I think conservatism can come in. That's where I think Republicans can embrace conservatism at last, sell conservatism at last to the American people, and paint themselves as a clear and different alternative. Think about it. If you own a restaurant and you're going to open a restaurant and you're going to open it next door to a McDonald's, are you going to sell hamburgers? Hell no. You're going to go out of business. You're going to sell pizza or chicken or Mexican food or whatever. You survive in life. You thrive in life by differentiating yourself from the competition. And in my estimation, the Republican Party has done a, excuse my French, piss poor job of doing that through the last several elections. Now, Mitt Romney was a good man. I'm not going to trash him or cast again. He was never my favorite, but I was certainly more enthusiastic about him than Barack Obama. 
Matt was a good man, but he was not the right man for the job of clearly articulating an alternative to democratic politics. He was the right job out of the two for the presidency, don't get me wrong. But in terms of explaining conservatism to America, selling conservatism to America, and moving America further to the right, Mitt was never going to be that guy. Frankly, he couldn't sell conservatism because at his core, he didn't believe in it himself. He had some conservative ideas, but he was never going to be that truly different person from what we've seen in Washington. He was never going to be able to say he was truly a 180 from Barack Obama. You know, one thing that human beings have shown over the years, whether we're talking politics or anything else, is that human beings find it easiest to look at things in, in, in black and white, not shades of gray. Good and bad, black and white. That's how, we, that's how we roll. Like it or not, that's how human beings operate. I mean, a lot of you know that I have a background in professional wrestling of all things. I've been in that business for 15 years. And you know in wrestling you have the good guys and the bad guys, or as we call them, baby faces and heels. And the reason that works, the reason you've always seen it, is because it makes it easy for people to follow along. They identify who they like, who they don't like, and they can easily fall into place with it. You know, sometimes I see younger wrestlers that say, oh, I don't want to be a good guy, I don't want to be a bad guy, I want to be a tweener. I want to be, you know, on the fence. And you always tell them, well, you'll, you'll never sell a ticket, no one will care. That's how human beings are in every aspect of life. You know, we, we, we don't think of things in shades of gray. We want good and bad, black and white, Pepsi and Coke. That's how we are. And if you don't differentiate yourself, if you don't show yourself as being clearly different than the alternative in any aspect of life, you will never succeed. That's why Mitt Romney lost. That's why the Republicans lost. The Republicans have to at long last realize that no matter how far to the center we go, no matter how much like the left we become, no matter how many of their asinine ideas we start to embrace, the media, the pop culture, and so forth will still savage us. They'll still castigate us. They'll still jump down our throats. I mean, remember John McCain used to be, before he ran for president, he used to be the Republican that all the liberals liked and that all the media would talk glowingly about until he became the nominee. Then suddenly he was as bad as everybody else. We've got to stop chasing the idea of being, a, being given a fair shake by the media because it won't happen. No matter what we do, no matter what we say we believe, no matter how many of their ideas we try to embrace. Instead, we have to understand they're going to castigate us no matter what. So why not just be who we are and be honest about it and provide that clear alternative that so many of us embrace each and every day? Great example is that financial cliff uh, situation that's coming up that everybody in Washington is talking about right now. There's a lot of people on the right and in the Republican Party who are saying that we should give in on increasing taxes on the wealthy. But I disagree. We cannot allow the Democrats to hold us hostage here. We must stand for what is right in a unified way, just like we did on Obamacare. You know, in Obamacare, even though it passed, not a single Republican voted for it. And that means when this thing hits the fan, when the economy goes to crap because of it, and it will, the Democrats will have to own it. You can't blame us for it. None of us voted for it. We should do the same thing on this financial cliff thing, on this uh, raising taxes on the wealthy thing. None of us should fall for their little trick because it is a trick. They know that if we go along with their plans, which will only wreck the economy in the long run, then they've got cover. Then they can say, well, this was bipartisan. Oh, no, no, no. We cannot let this be bi bipartisan. If you're going to raise taxes on the wealthy, then you're not going to you should not have our support. And when it all goes to hell, you will have to take all the blame. And I know a lot of people hear that philosophy and think it's a bit like playing chicken. Well, I think back to a sign that used to uh, used to be on Barry Goldwater's plane back in his 1964 presidential election. Uh, he had a sign on his plane that said, "Brinksmanship is better than chicken ship." And I think the Republican Party needs to embrace that philosophy again. Let's not give them the cover they want. You can't negotiate, you can't find common ground with people who are evil, so why should we try? And I know you're thinking when I say that, well, what if we actually do go over the fiscal cliff? What if this thing does hit the fan? What are you going to do then? Well, I hate to say this, and some of you are going to think I'm crazy, but I wonder if the American people, after this election, I wonder if they need to hit rock bottom. I thought they already would have, given all the unemployment and the bad economy and everything, but I guess they didn't. You know, if any of you have, have had a loved one who's been involved in drugs and had a really bad drug problem, you know that a lot of times they won't turn around until they hit rock bottom, right? 
And you know that what you think would be their rock bottom probably isn't. Their actual personal rock bottom is so far below what you would even consider that, that it blows your mind. Maybe that's where the American people are at. I would have thought, we would have thought, that the last four years would have been rock bottom for the American people. Evidently it wasn't. So maybe, as bad as it sounds, maybe we need to go over that financial cliff. Maybe we need to go over that fiscal cliff to prove to these people, once and for all, that liberalism is a one-way road to hell. Maybe that will finally get it through your head. Maybe you'll have to rehab. And then at that point, when you have to go through political rehab, the Republicans can be there and say, look, we consistently told you all along this is what would happen and why. Now we are the alternative. Come with us. But we won't be able to do that if we kowtow to them. There is a historical precedent for this. Back in 1964, Lyndon Johnson won his election in a landslide by any measure you want to make. And he did so on a vision of big government. And he didn't hide it. He did so on a vision of a government that would solve, that could potentially solve all of humanity's great problems, and the American people bought into it. Like it or not, they did. They thought it was a great idea. They bought into it. But what happened just four years later? Well, the American people experienced four years of big government liberalism, and they found in 1968 violence in their streets, violence in their college campuses, a youth culture that was running amok and tearing down all the all the pillars of society that had brought them up. They, they saw a dependent class grow in America that was siphoning off of the workers, siphoning off of the productive people, something we still have today thanks to the great society. And they said no more. They said, okay, we tried this liberalism stuff and it bit us in the butt. And they elected Richard Nixon, a man who I don't have a lot of love for, but in 1968 he ran on an idea of getting back to the foundations of America and getting back to law and order. People responded to that. I think we will be able to do that again in four years after all hell breaks loose during the second term of Barack Obama. We have to be ready for it. It is time for the Republican Party to man up and be decisive for once. No more of this lily livered moving to the center and trying to be everything to everybody. That doesn't work especially in a society today where the voting public is going more and more to the extremes, both extremes. Some are going extreme left. People like me are going to the extreme right. But a party in that environment that stays in the center is going to get nowhere. Now, you've already got a Democratic Party that's gone to the extreme left. See Barack Obama. We need to be the party that goes to the extreme right and provides that clear and decisive alternative to what they're selling, not a lighter version of it. Man up, Republican Party. It's time to save America. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.